from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. RSA 2024 was crowded, fuzzy, vibrant, and chaotic, underscoring the very nature of the cybersecurity industry. This market has kind of a self-propelling energy with a dynamic that blends tons of money, an ever-present and capable adversary, technical innovation, public policy, geopolitics, and a mashing together of the digital and physical worlds. Now, despite the logical need to consolidate tooling and simplify, organizations find themselves constantly searching for answers to new problems that they face every day, week, month, and year. And while RSA 2023 gave us hope that AI would eventually tip the balance in favor of defenders and simplify and help us consolidate, RSA 2024 highlighted that Gen AI is yet another attack vector requiring novel and new approaches to protect the unknown. And that requires oftentimes new tools. Hello and welcome to this week's The Key Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we share our perspectives on RSA 2024 with some insights from some of the leading voices in the community. Let's take a look at the highlights from our perspective, and there were many, too many for us to cover them all. RSA 2024 was held at Moscone Center in San Francisco. It felt bigger than last year. Last year it was north of 42,000, so it's possible there were 45 to 50,000 people attending, perhaps even more. Last year, we heard a lot about AI for bad, i.e. bad actors writing better phishing emails, for example, to infiltrate organizations, and AI for good to allow things like Gen AI to improve the experience of SecOps pros and the security analysts. But this year, we heard a lot more about AI as an exposure, a new attack vector for the bad guys. AI is different, and it needs new approaches to make its use safe. Here's how Zscaler CEO Jay Chaudhry describes both sides of that equation. Take a listen. AI is a fascinating technology. Like many other technologies, it has two sides. It can help with business productivity, but it can be very dangerous. Think of a simple example. You can ask ChatGPT and say, tell me all the VPN systems this company has and what vulnerabilities do they have. It would have taken them days to collect this information. Now it's available in a matter of seconds. So identifying your attack surface, the starting point of attack becomes easy. As you said, phishing emails can be written very nicely. Then they cannot go from there. So we got to fight AI with AI. We are leveraging AI to actually analyze billions and billions of logs to actually figure out in this uh, a needle in the haystack to see if two users in this, in this company got compromised and the bad guys are trying to move to step two and three and four. So figuring out this technology is a big thing for us. But in addition to that, CISOs also want to make sure that they can securely use AI services. That has three pieces to it. One, they want to know what services are our employees going to use? CISOs aren't about stopping them. CISOs are supposed to enable business. AI is a business enabler, but it starts with where are they going? Number two, they want to control access. There are thousands of AI services. It's not just chat GPT. Which services do I want my companies to use? Here are five or 10 sanctioned ones. And number three, when they use it, they need to use it safely to make sure they don't really submit the source code of the company to say, do QA on it. And so Zscaler can do all three for our customers. Most of our large customers are using this security to what they call secure use of AI. Now the other trend that came into light this year is the broader awareness that critical infrastructure is exposed. It's almost as though the AI awakening has led folks to better understand that the potential of AI to do bad things with drones, other machine intelligence, puts the electric grid, water supply, data centers, energy facilities, all forms of transportation and many more services we rely upon at risk. 
Now, as we've written in the past, chaos means cash for criminals and investors alike. And we sat down with a number of innovative startups and heard about novel security approaches. Companies like Island, Lasso, Dope Security, Thrive, Cranium, Fortanix, Finite State, Opaque, and many others. Here's the CEO of Lasso Security, Elad Schulman, explaining the challenges of securing Gen AI. Please play the clip. Uh, generative AI introduces a new way of interacting with AI. It's a conversational, unstructured, situational interactions and basically breaks the entire cybersecurity models today. And you need to build kind of like a new operating system for cybersecurity where you need to handle these new attacks like jailbreaks and prompt injection, data leaks. So the interaction going to the model and going back from the model is something that requires new solutions. And this is why we're here to help organizations join the generative AI era, but in a secure, safe way. And basically, we're an enabling technology for organizations. So a lot of so that's a startup going after a new problem that Gen AI has created. And how about one more? Here's Kanal Argawal talking about a new approach to disrupt to disrupt an existing market. He's the CEO of Dope Security. Yeah, that's what they named the company because it's dope. Take a listen is that there's a mainstream area of a cybersecurity that's existed for a very long time, and it's called Secure Web Gateway. And once upon a time, it's essentially a filter. What can you access on the internet? And it was a box sitting in the office, and it would, it's a proxy that would prevent you from accessing, call it thepiratebay.org or pornhub.com. And then that box got moved into a data center. And then what we said is like, that's Gen 3, is let's just get rid of the box entirely. And that's it. You had a box hat in your office, you had a box in the data center, and now it's gone. That's dope security. Now, as always, folks, we're talking about M&A. Akamai announced it was acquiring no-name security for $450 million. This is a company that had raised more than $200 million, so it's not a really great outcome for investors. I think the revenue was somewhere around $20 million. They, so they sold for about 22x revenue or, or change. So, you know, not great, uh, but it's an example of the music stops and you want to have a seat to sit in. Lacework, a company that raised more than a billion dollars and at one point was valued north of eight billion, was rumored to be selling to Wiz for under 300 million. That deal fell apart during due diligence, perhaps over what was going to happen to all that cash that they maybe still had on their balance sheet. Meanwhile, Wiz closed a billion dollar round at a $12 billion valuation I think it's raised now uh, close to $2 billion, or actually $2 billion. So the company is a revenue multiple in the mid-20x range, which has been staggering progress. We're going to talk about them in a minute. And we spent time uh, this week at Toma Bravo and Insight Capital, two prominent PE firms that have made massive invest investments in cybersecurity. Now, many of those will pay off, but several PE firms' portfolio companies are being sh shopped to placate LPs who are clamoring for liquidity. So they're gonna to try to sell certain assets off so they can wet the beaks of the LPs. And we explored some IPO prospects with two likely candidates, Sneaks, Peter McKay, and Nick Schneider of Arctic Wolf, both companies we expect to go public when the IPO market loosens. And public policy is playing an increasingly important role in cybersecurity, from executive orders from the President of the United States to to self-governing cross-industry efforts to create more transparency. Now, part of the concern is that when a breach occurs, there are no standards for disclosure. A lot of times people wait days. Sometimes they try not to talk, not to disclose. So Zias, Zias Caravalla and I hosted a panel that was focused on CISA's Secure by Design pledge to develop and adhere to standards for disclosure. Listen to Suzanne Spaulding. She's the former Undersecretary of Homeland Security, shining a light on this issue, pun intended. The idea is, you know, we all know that if you train to fight in the dark, you could meet your adversary at night or you could turn off the light and you'd have the advantage, right? Think about the daredevil. Uh, <laughs> but what we have is a transparent world that's coming at us full steam ahead, where lights are being turned on all over the world. And, and the darkness that, uh, that allows you to keep secrets is, va is vanishing, is going away. So we need to train to fight in the light. And whoever can learn to operate with a level of radical transparency 
is going to have the advantage in the world that's coming at us. Great, thank you for that. And finally, despite all the talk about tools consolidation, Tools Creek is winning and continues to be the dominant theme. So let's explore that a bit. Two weeks ago, we introduced some new data to you that we're showing here. It's from a survey of 321 security pros that we did with ETR. The purpose of the survey was part of an advance to RSA. We have 321 uh, SecOps pros from C-suites down to practitioners. 50% of the sample was actually attending RSA. Look at this data. Over the next 12 months, do you expect to increase, decrease the number, or increase or decrease the number of cybersecurity vendors in your stack? 51% said increase, 31%, 37% rather said stay the same, only 9% said decrease, and you can see in the red. Only 6% of the sample cited decrease, or sorry, consolidation as a means to simplify their security stack and get to a decrease. So that is really an astounding uh, finding of this survey. We ran this data by several companies, including Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, and Zscaler, and some others. And they all said the same thing, that they see the market differently, that in their space, they're consolidating. But when we talked to the practitioners, they said the opposite. Every, every practitioner we, talk, we talked to said increasing. But here's some other evidence that this trend is the real deal. So take a look at this next chart. This is from that same survey, the 170 uh, practitioners and, and CISOs who were attending RSA. We said, what new to you vendors are at the top of your list to visit or meet with at RSA? <laughs> look at other vendors. 72% of the responders, respondents. So this just, again, underscores people are looking for new ways to plug holes. They're looking for best of breed. Now, of course, again, you see CrowdStrike's right up there, Cisco, Palo Alto, Okta, Zscaler, Fortinet, Sentinel-1, Wiz. I mean, they're, they're showing, you know, semi-prominently in this, but compared to other not even close. Why do we have these underlined? Because each of these, and probably probably could underline every one of them, has a theme around consolidation and simplification. And we're going to look into some of those companies a, a little later in this episode. But again, just more evidence that this trend of consolidation, it's really not a trend. It is perhaps isolated in certain pockets for certain companies, but it is definitely not a broad trend across the industry. All right, let's look at a couple of companies and see how the stock market is acting for them. Here's year-to-date relative performance for CrowdStrike, Okta, Palo Alto, the Bug ETF, which is, let's call it the benchmark, and of course, Zscaler. It's been a mixed year for cyber, and we're seeing some bifurcation in performance. Mm -hmm. There've been situations where companies hit their number and gave guidance that scared off investors a little bit. This was the case with Zscaler. Well, the the, the quarter was actually good. The guidance was backloaded toward Q4, and they cited it's kind of an overweight toward large deals, and that scared some investors. Others, like Rapid7, had a slight earnings beat, but the street didn't like the guide. But you can see here, CrowdStrike is the standout and is priced to perform, priced to perfection, as they sometimes say. Okta has had a rough go over the past couple of years with the Auth0 acquisition and a couple of breaches that kind of took it down, took the stock down. Um, but it had a strong beat and raise last quarter, so you can see the performance there. Last quarter, Palo Alto's uh, CEO, Nikesh Arora, mentioned this, this phrase, spending fatigue, which set off a chain reaction. I think it had a, if he had a do-over, he probably wouldn't have used that phrase because George Kurtz of CrowdStrike pounced on it, as did uh, Jay Chaudhry. Um, but nonetheless, the real blow to Palo Alto was the government's pause on the big Thunderdome project. Now, Palo Alto had been qualified for that. So that was like a real windfall for the company that they had to take out of their guide, take out of the, obviously, the quarter. But that looks like it's back on track. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see how they play that. They may not put it back in the guide and they may just, you know, bring it in and, and show a beat down the road. Um, Palo Alto had a number of announcements at RSA. I mean, everyone did. Uh, but the customers we talked to were pretty excited about it, as were some of the Palo Alto sellers who were just chomping at the bit to get out into the market and close some deals. There's a lot of deals being done at uh, 
at, at RSA for sure. Big, big customer event. So Zscaler is the outlier on this chart. It's worth mentioning that Barclays analyst Saket Kalia wrote a note several weeks ago citing a survey that they did, that Barclays did. N was around 100, so it wasn't a massive survey, but 100's a good indicator, and they, they have done this survey many times. So they had some time series data. It showed momentum for Zscaler. We have some data on that as well that we'll show you. It also showed for the first time a market decline in hardware-based firewalls. So with Zscaler as a pure play SASE vendor, that is a company that essentially created this category, Socket felt that the divergence in, in valuations from the likes of CrowdStrike was unwarranted and could represent an attractive entry point for investors. So let's take a look at some of the horses on the track in this race. This is one of our favorite charts. If you're following this program, you've seen it before, this XY graph. The vertical axis is net score, and that is a measure of spending momentum. The horizontal axis, it's called overlap, and that's basically, this is a survey of 1,800 IT decision makers. Essentially, the N in that survey divided by the, the 1,800. That's how the the plot is determined. So you can see in the right-hand side, we have this, this table starting with Microsoft, Wiz, CrowdStrike. So you can see we've sorted it on net score. Again, net score is a, a measure of spending momentum. We'll explain that in some detail in a moment. And then you can see the, the N, the shared N in those 1,800 accounts. The bigger the N means the bigger the market presence you have. That informs the, the horizontal axis, net score on the vertical axis, the red dotted line at 40%. Anything over that is considered exceedingly uh, high spending momentum. So you can see Wiz is there, Hashi and Datadog are up, up there, Zscaler, Sentinel-1 right on the line, CrowdStrike over the line, which is, you know, they've just been performing amazingly. Okta popping back up. Pre-pandemic, Okta was well above that 40% line and then given the challenges that it had, with the Auth0 acquisition and other issues, execution issues that sort of pop back down. Palo Alto, you know, given its size, you know, very prominent there, just under that line, and you can see this massive pack of, of folks. What's interesting to us in cyber is ETR basically uses, you know, the red, yellow, green methodology as you go down in net score. I, 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 we've plotted here like the top 20, and none of them are, are even yellow. So they're all in the green. And that is very unique for the cyber market. Uh, oh, sorry, very unique to the cyber market. Many other markets, you know, take a market like storage, for example, it's it's all red, you know, or yellow. Uh, so some of these legacy markets are just not as dynamic as security. So it just, it both underscores the opportunity for, you know, investors and, uh, and, and startups and companies to gain share. It also underscores the complexity for practitioners who are trying to defend against attackers every day. All right, I said I was gonna dig into the methodology that ETR uses, the net score me methodology. I'm gonna do that now and explain it in a bit more detail. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna use Zscaler's data as an example for no other reason other than it's handy. So what this chart shows is the granularity of Zscaler's net scores. So this is how net score is calculated. And this is done over time. You can see we go back from January 22 on. So let me take a minute to explain. The lime green is new customer ads. So it's the percent of customers that are adding Zscaler new. Now you remember in the previous chart, we had 340 Zscaler customers. So it's the percent of those 340 customers in the April survey, that lime green 12% of that 340 are adding Zscaler as a new logo first time. The forest green is the existing customers that are spending 6% or more on the platform in the next 12 months. The gray is spending is flat, plus or minus 5%. That pinkish is spending down 6% or worse. And then the 4% is containing or even churning the platform. Subtract the reds, from the greens and you get net score. And that's that blue line that you see. Okay, so it's sort of bottomed in October and starting to show an uptrend. That uptrend would be consistent 
with Socket Kalia's uh, survey data suggesting that Zscaler has a tailwind. We'll see because the guide was really b- backloaded toward the fourth quarter. That yellow line is the number of mentions for Zscaler divided by the total survey N, which is around 1,800. And you can see it sort of pops around a little bit. The, the other point of this methodology, and, and you want to remember this, this is a this is percent of customers. So this is a customer count, not representative of dollars. Now, we have ways of digging into the dollars. For instance, we can look at some of the big spenders, the Fortune 100 or the giant private companies, which is a category that ETR has that tends to be a bellwether, you know, or even the Global 2000. So some of these larger companies, you can infer they're bigger spenders. And we can do cuts on that. But for this breaking analysis, we'll just leave it, leave it there for now. So you got that background. So given that, we can now do some comparisons over time on that net score with some of the other names that we like to track in this space. So this chart shows net score, or again, spending momentum over time. It's again, it's the net percent of customers that are spending more. And we've shown five companies here, Wiz, CrowdStrike, which is in the yellow, a little hard to see, Zscaler, Palo Alto, and Cisco. And we've added in the text, the ends from the survey, just to give you context context on the relative size. So this is interesting. You know, we're showing Wiz, which, as we said, Wiz is you know the the now company, if you will, the hot company, like Snowflake a couple of years ago. Wiz's net score was nearing eighty percent, and it's come down to CrowdStrike's CrowdStrike's elevated level. Remember, anything above that 40% line is considered highly elevated. But it's interesting to note that the, the end, so remember, you know, this is a random survey. So ETR goes to, to its, its IT decision maker panel and asks them about their environment and their spending plans. And so, and the customers r- respond. So it's not as though they're trying to target specifically companies. They're just going to companies in their base. And by the way, people often ask me, what's, what's the over time, what's the repeat rate? And it's 75 to 85% are repeat survey takers. So we're, we, we feel pretty good about the consistency here. At any rate, as you can see, CrowdStrike, Zscaler, and Palo Alto all have substantially higher market penetrations as indicated by the proxy of N um, than does Wiz. And we'll see where Wiz goes from here. With its smaller presence, you'd want to see it sustain ahead of the others you know, significantly. And we also show Cisco. Cisco has a big presence in the market, as you can see by their larger N. Cisco also made several notable announcements. Um, one was around XDR and SIM integration with Splunk, which is great because it didn't take long for them to actually you know, announce some kind of integration. Uh, and then a few weeks back, it announced its HyperShield, which the company is very excited about, um, as, as are many of its customers that we talk to. And this is intended to be available in August of this year. We'll see if Cisco hits that, I think it's a really positive sign. So we'll be watching for that. All right, so this is a brief overview of what we saw at RSA and hopefully connects some of the company momentum that we see or connects to that momentum. And we're gonna be tracking the earnings of CrowdStrike, Palo Alto and Zscaler coming up end of May, early June. And we'll make sure that we update you. And we're gonna close now with some thoughts on the things that we're watching in this space. So let's start with that the point that we've been talking about consistently, which is this, this the vendor and the tools heterogeneity. Uh, David Linticum talked about this on theCUBE this week. This remains an ongoing fact of life. It adds to complexity, it adds to cost, and continues to be a perpetual challenge for the marketplace. Why is that? One practitioner said to me, the reason is, first of all, this individual, she said, when we asked her about the survey, she said, absolutely increasing, as did virtually every practitioner we talked to. But she, she was pretty uh, prescient when she said, here's why. Innovation is happening faster than consolidation. And that is, it's kind of underscores the trend that we're seeing in the market. Now, the third point here is while cyber budgets are growing faster than overall IT spending, they're not unlimited. Let's talk about that for a second. So overall IT budgets are probably growing in the three and a half, 3.4%. 
this year based on the ETR survey data that we currently see. At least that's the current expectation. Cyber budgets are growing faster. We know from the last survey or the last drill down that the vast majority of customers, 87%, are increasing their cybersecurity spend. And about 75% of those are increasing more than 5%. There's a big chunk that are well over 5%, some over 15%. So when you dig into the data, we would estimate that cybersecurity spending is growing two to three times faster than that 3.4, 3.5% rate that we talked about earlier. But again, budgets are not unlimited. So CISOs have to figure out how to allocate their bets. And if to the extent that they can save, they will. So this is why we think that despite the dissonance between what the vendors claim and what's, what we see actually happening in the market, two points. One is we actually do believe that the leading consolidators like CrowdStrike actually are seeing consolidation. The CrowdStrike doesn't have like 100% of the market, a relatively small share of the overall $200 billion market. And two, this says there's significant upside opportunity for consolidation, especially as budgets tighten. Okay, fourth point here. The AI awakening has catalyzed, we think, a greater awareness of just how exposed we are with critical infrastructure. If you think about a lot, we had a lot of discussions about you know, AI being used you know, to go after critical infrastructure, the, the threats to the United States in particular, uh, of the bringing together of the physical and the digital worlds. When you think about potential for drones attacking power plants and, 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 and electrical grids and you know, nuclear facilities, and the like. So that's, that is something that I think people basically see what AI is capable of, and it's the uh-oh moment of what happens next. How do we protect this critical infrastructure, and where are the holes? And there are many. And finally, you know, this chaotic market means opportunity for hackers, for investors, and, and, and entrepreneurs, and we don't see that changing for quite some time. What do you see at RSA 2024. Let us know. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks very much to Alex Myerson, who is on production with Ken Schiffman. Alex also does our podcasts. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Oath is our editor-in-chief over at SiliconANGLE. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com, and you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn posts. And please do check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.